How you doing guys and welcome to another video. This is on Volume 4C on covalent structures, so let's dive straight into it. So, Volume 4C, we look at resonance, molecular polarity, and we talk about covalent and network lattices. IB understandings and applications, we need to have an understanding about resonance structures. We need to know about giant network and, and covalent layer lattices. We need to be able to predict a few polarities from their geometries, and we build on some of the uh, Lewis structures from the last video. So the following molecules apply a variety of rules um, for the charge centers and lone pairs, and some are important exceptions to the octet rule. So remember that we use the Vespa theory to determine the shape of the molecules. So for example, the first one, sulfur dioxide. We have a sulfur and two oxygen. So how many electrons is that? Well, that's six plus two times six, which gives us 18 electrons. So that means we have nine pairs of electrons in this molecule. Now, how can we put those nine pairs together? Well, the sulfurs, they must be bonded to the oxygens in some way. The oxygens generally have two lone pairs of electrons. So I can go on and put those in. That gives me a total of six pairs of electrons, and I need nine. So let's go ahead and let's make that sulfur to oxygen bond a double bond, making up another two. And then, well, the only other thing I can do is sulfur must have a lone pair of electrons as well. So that gives me this type of molecular geometry. The sulfur with two double bonds to each oxygen, two, a double bond to each oxygen, and the sulfur with the non-bonding electrons up the top. Those non-bonding electrons will push the oxygen bonds down and we will have a bent type molecule. Carbon monoxide has 10 electrons in the molecule, meaning five pairs. So how can I arrange this for five pairs of electrons? Well, the carbon and the oxygen, they must be connected together. The oxygen generally has two lone pairs of electrons, but if I just put those in, then I won't have enough bonds between the carbon and the oxygen. So this one's a little bit more tricky. What happens here is there's actually a, co a coordinate bond between the carbon and the oxygen. The oxygen donates two of its non-bonding electrons to the carbon, giving it a dative bond, and then the carbon actually has a lone pair of electrons out the back. So this would be described as a linear molecule with a coordinate bond. We need to talk about if a molecule overall is polar or nonpolar. So for a molecule to be polar, it must have polar covalent bonds. There must be a difference in electronegativity between the two atoms and the electrons in the bond. And those partial charges must be distributed asymmetrically across the molecule. So there has to be an overall positive and negative end. If we have a look at formaldehyde, the oxygen will carry a negative charge, the hydrogens will carry a positive charge, so it has a positive and negative end, which we call a dipole, so it is thus polar. Carbon dioxide, the oxygens will be negative, the carbon will be positive in the middle, it doesn't have any overall positive or negative end, so it's referred to as nonpolar. In the last example, tetrafluoromethane, again, the fluoros, they will be negatively charged, the carbon in the middle, positively charged, so it is also referred to as nonpolar. A molecule that contains polar covalent bonds will form a dipole. A polar molecule must have those dipoles distributed so there is an overall positive and overall negatively charged end of the molecule. So here's a few more examples. Ammonia, we've looked at ammonia in past videos. NH3 with the lone pair of electrons sticking up the top. That lone pair will give this molecule a very strong negative charge up the top and the hydrogens with their lower electronegativity will be positive, so it's definitely polar. HF, hydrogen fluoride, that has a number of non-bonding electrons, the fluorine very electronegative, the hydrogen not so, so yes, positive, negative, polar. Trichloromethane, well the hydrogen, it will be positively charged and each of those chlorines, well they will have some non-bonding electrons, also a high electronegativity, so we've got a negative end, positive end, therefore polar. 
Hydrogen sulfide, SH2, the sulfur with its two pairs of non-bonding electrons, it will have a negative charge. The hydrogen will have the positive charge, so definitely polar. H2, no difference in electronegativity, so non-polar. And ethene with two carbons in the middle, which will be the slightly positive, the negatively charged atoms, the hydrogen surrounding it, slightly positively charged. Symmetrical, so overall it would be called nonpolar. Okay, one of the harder things for chemical bonding and structure is the discussion about a resonance structure. And a resonance structure is one where the electrons are not particularly in one spot. They can resonate or move between different parts of the molecule. So if we have a look at the ozone Lewis structure, what could happen here is the electrons in that double bond could actually move locations. So that means that there is an equal way of representing this molecule with a double bond between the two oxygens on the right hand side. The molecule must obey all the rules, but that means that there will be another lone pair on the oxygen at the end. So that double bond can essentially flip between those two spots. This is called a resonance structure, and it's like a blend. Um, it blends between the two, and in theory, we don't really know which one exists at any one time. So sometimes we use dotted lines just to represent that there is a double bond between those two atoms, but we're not sure where it is. Those two double bonds will have this, those two bonds will have the same length and same strength, and it will be somewhere in between a double and a single. So a couple of harder ones to do, we're going to use this technique to work out the number of electrons and the electron pairs. So the carbonate ion has 24 electrons, which means we've got to account for 12 pairs of electrons. So my carbon is going to be my central atom, and it must be connected to the three oxygens. I have an extra two electrons in this structure because it's negatively two charged. So here I am trying to put in my oxygens connected to my carbon. So now, how can I get 12 electron pairs around this molecule? Well, I'll start off by having a double bond between one of the oxygens, and then I can go through and the rest must be taken up by lone pairs on the oxygen. The carbon would be full. So it can't take any more electrons, so the rest of the electrons must be around the oxygens. And in fact, they are. And if we draw this out, its geometry is trigonal planar, with a double bond between one of the oxygens and then two single bonds between the other oxygens. Those oxygens with the single bonds, well, they've gained those extra electrons, so that's where the extra charge comes from. Now this is a resonance structure because that double bond, it could be between any of those three oxygen atoms. So it would be correct to draw any of those oxygens with a double bond, just as long as we take into account the location of the non-bonding electrons around the other oxygen atoms. The nitrate ion, we can work that out in the exact same way. Nitrogen has five, we have three oxygens times six plus one for the extra negative charge. Means I've got to have 12 pairs of electrons around my nitrogen atom. So I start off with connecting all of the oxygens. The nitrogen, well it really can only have three bonds, but in this case it's going to form four, giving me the rest of the pairs to be carried by the oxygens. So the oxygens will carry the rest of the pairs, and what ends up happening is we have to have two oxygens with double bonds. So the, nit the nitrogen in the nitrate ion expands its octet, it has more electrons in the outer shell than it usually would, it has an overall negative charge, and that those electrons in those double bonds can move positions and it can resonate between one or the other. As long as two of the oxygens have double bonds, then we have drawn a correct structure. These can be a little bit tricky and they're a little bit difficult to explain, um, and I will go through a few in class. But it's just a matter of working out where the electrons need to go and what will suit the VESPA rules. Remember to draw the brackets with the negative charge when you draw a resonance structure.
If we have a look at benzene, which is six carbon atoms arranged in a hexagonal ring, we see that we have a 120 degree bond angle for each of the carbons. At the top of each of the carbons, there's a hydrogen connected, and this molecule can resonate as well. So the location of those double bonds can change, and it doesn't change the way the molecule functions. So in this case, if we just shift the double bonds around, we have a resonance structure, putting in my hydrogens, and every carbon has one hydrogen. The formula for benzene, C6H6, and it often pops up, so make sure you can identify it. A simplified structure for benzene will be to emit the hydrogens because we just know that they're there, or sometimes there is a hexagon with a circle placed in the middle. The circle represents that there are resonance structures available. So an important command term for IB chemistry is compare, where we need to give an account of the similarities and differences between two or more things. Compare the structures of methanoic acid and the methanoate ion and in terms of their possible resonance structures. So the methanoate ion, uh, the, the methanoate acid, with its OH, it cannot resonate. There's no places for the electrons in the double bond to move around. But in the methanoate ion, there is the possibility of a resonance occurring. What can happen is the oxygen that has the negative charge, it's taken the electrons from the hydrogen, so it has an extra pair of electrons. So that means that one of those pairs of the electrons could go into the single bond to make a double covalent bond, leaving a single bond on the other oxygen. So again, we don't know exactly where that double bond will be. All we know is that one of the oxygens will have a double bond and the other a single. Sometimes we can also draw this with the dotted lines to indicate that it is a resonance structure and that the electron belongs to both of those oxygens and we don't know where it is at any given time. The important thing about this type of molecule is in the methanoic acid molecule, it has a carbon to oxygen double bond and a carbon to oxygen single bond, whereas in the methanoate ion, it's somewhere in between those. Having a look at carbon, carbon has three allotropes, which are three different types. The first one is graphite, which is very hard in one direction, but quite slippery and soft in another. It has a layered lattice, where we have strong covalent bonds within the layer and then weak bonds between the layers. Each of the carbon atoms has three bonds, which means there is one delocalized electron that is shared within the layer, and the electrons can move through the layers. Every carbon atom has a trigonal planar arrangement because there are three covalent bonds, so that means each of them would have a 120 degree bond angle. Diamond, the most the hardest naturally occurring substance. In diamond, we have a carbon which is bonded to four other carbons via a strong covalent bond. They're arranged in a regular tetrahedral structure, and we say that the bonding is three-dimensional. It's a tetrahedral, so there's bonding above and below. The diamond lattice is known as a covalent network lattice. The graphite lattice lattice was a covalent layer lattice. The bond angle in diamond will be 109.5. It won't conduct electricity because all of the electrons are involved in a bond and its strength comes from the fact that it has four strong covalent bonds. A fullerene or a buckyball is a compound of carbon which contains a series of atoms arranged in regular hexagons and pentagons and it looks a lot like a soccer ball. The bonding in a buckyball is not referred to as a lattice. But if we look at the diagram, we can see that each carbon, again, only has three bonds. That means that it will conduct electricity because of the delocalized electrons, but it won't be a better conductor than graphite because the electrons are simply moving around and they can't move in one general direction. So the buckyball will conduct electricity, but not as well as the graphite. There are other network lattices that involve other members of carbon's group, like silicon. Silicon has the ability to form four covalent bonds, but the length and strength of the silicon-silicon bond is 
it's got a longer length, which means its strength is less, which means that it doesn't form as strong lattices as carbon. So that means it is more reactive because the bond is longer, it's easier to break, and that means its melting and boiling temperature is lower than the melting and boiling temperature of the diamond. There's an image up there on the left hand side. Another silicon lattice is a silicon dioxide lattice where we have one silicon which is bonded to four oxygens and this continues through the lattice. So volume four, see some top tips, know some of the exceptions and use that rule to try and identify the number of electron pairs. This one might take some practice, so we might practice in class a little bit more. Thanks for watching guys. Don't forget, drop a like on the video, subscribe if you're new and I'll see you.